Hi guys, today's show is brought to you by the extremely kind donations by our donors over at Patreon. Andrew, tell them a little bit about Patreon. Um, if you would like to donate to the show to keep us going, or uh, even get access to... What do we have? We have more commentaries. We just put one out, actually, right? We have, uh... Yeah, the Phantom, Phantom of the, the Opera, Opera out now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we did the, the movie that was uh, not very good. Um, and for our new for our $1 patrons, we are doing After Hours, where we just have a little bit of a conversation that we record after our natural recordings, just to give the $1 patrons some stuff as well. Andrew, why don't you list off our patrons currently? Sure, we have uh, Stephanie L., Terry Needleman, Max Lunig, Benjamin Lear, Chris O'Kelly, Lily Ackles, Mackenzie Horner, John Donna, Taryn the Duck, Melissa Goldman, Jess Lightning, Ewan Cassidy, Haley McDonald, Taskier, Colin McLeod... Fire of September, Sam Bergman, uh, Mina Moniri, uh, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, Monica uh, Thoreau. Mm -hmm. They give us a little extra financial support that helps us keep the lights on here at Musicals with Cheese. If you'd like to join them in supporting us and get tons of fun perks such as patron-only commentaries, our episodes a day early or even earlier, and some after-hours recordings of me and Andrew, come join us over at Patreon. All right, are you ready to get the show started, Andrew? I'm ready to go. Let's do All it. All right, let's go. I'm Jesse McAnally. And I'm Andrew DeWolf. And welcome to Musicals with Cheese, a podcast where I try to get Andrew to like musical theater. And Andrew, guess what we have? Today we have a very special guest. A super special guest. I beat you to it, Jess. <laughs> Please welcome to our podcast, actress, writer, and incredible person, Caitlin Bitsagai. Hi, hi, hi. Thanks for having me. <laughs> How are you feeling today? I'm feeling good. I'm I'm excited to get into it. I love to be talking musical theater. Mm -hmm. It's better so, you guys than people I bother at like Shoprite. <laughs> so I just just talk to random people on the street. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so give us a little bit of your background on musical theater and your relationship with that, just to get that started out of the way. Well, I I'm a comedic actress who can't sing, so uh, it's more just you know aspirational for me. A total fangirl. Um, my dad actually loved musicals and, um, we would go like growing up to national tours and stuff like that. Uh, I'm from Indiana, so we weren't going to Broadway all the time, but we went a couple of times and, uh, listening to original cast recordings on, you know, good old cassette and then CD. Um, yeah, just a lover, not an expert by any means, but I pretty much will go and enjoy any of them, even if they're bad. You know how I'm feeling today? How are you feeling, Jess? I'm feeling like I'm coming out of makeup. <sighs> <laughs> what a funny, what a funny gag, Jess! You really hit the nail on the head with that one. In case you guys haven't noticed, um, by Caitlin's own request, this week we are covering Sunset Boulevard. Sure, I came out here to make my name. Wanted my pool, my dose of fame. Wanted my park and space at Warner's. But after a year of one room hell, a Murphy bed, a rancid smell, wallpaper peeling at the corners. Sunset Boulevard, twisting boulevard, secretive and rich, a little scary. Sunset Boulevard, tempting boulevard, waiting there to swallow the unwary. Sunset Boulevard is a musical with book and lyrics by Don Black and Christopher Hampton and music by Andrew Lloyd Webber, based on Billy Wilder's Academy Award-winning 1950 film of the same title. The plot revolves around Norma Desmond, a faded star of the silent screen era, living in the past in her decaying mansion on the fabled Los Angeles street. When young screenwriter Joe Gillis accidentally crosses her path, she sees in him an opportunity to make her return to the big screen. Romance and tragedy follow. Opening first in London in 1993, the musical has had several long runs internationally and also enjoyed extensive tours. However, it has been the subject of several legal battles and ultimately lost money due to its extraordinarily high running costs. So, guys, what do we think about yeah, Sunset Boulevard? I, I, I'm a lover. I'm a lover, not a hater. Uh, I saw the Broadway production in 1994, not with Glenn Close, though. She had already left the show by that point. I saw it with one Miss Betty Buckley, so not too shabby. Uh, and then I saw it again in 2017 uh, with Glenn Close. And, um, like, Total, like, bought the audio CD, I think, in 1994, you know, probably... I mean, it's amazing they lost money because just from me alone, they probably got like hundreds of dollars from the gift shop. 
Um, I'm impressed that they lost money and uh, just they had to really try. That CD. Yeah, they had to really try, and I'm 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 so happy for them. Um, they put they put their best effort into losing money, and they really nailed it. <laughs> you know, you and put your mind to something. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Lloyd Webber really did everything he possibly could to lose money on this show, I will say. <laughs> what what were the legal Honestly, battles for exactly? <laughs> well, there's the um, Patty Lapone Glenn Close debacle right. that everyone Oh n- so Patty I'm on Lapone Team Patty guys. Oh really? Interesting. Did you listen to both original cast recordings? Because yes. I actually I, think, and it, I think that the, I think the New York one is better, and I can't say if it's fully because of Glenn Close, but I think it's like funnier. Like they, I don't know, like whether you eye roll or laugh at some of the jokes in this show at all, I, I would understand other either <laughs> reaction. However, <laughs> I just don't. I don't think that the London cast was like told that there were punchlines. <laughs> <laughs> they just sort of roll over things. Um, they take it very yeah, seriously in in that. That's the 1993 because I think I was listening to that one. Correct. Uh, yes. Yeah, I was listening yeah. to that one, and they do seem to take it very seriously. Yeah, and I'm not sure if there was a legal. I don't know exactly what happened, but I I believe Patty Lapone and Andrew Lloyd Webber have never spoken since she didn't move it to. She didn't move to New York with the show. Can I go a little bit so into that good. history very quickly? I would love. I would love it. Because I just reread that section of Patty Lapone's memoir today just so I could spit this out. Amazing. <laughs> so Thank you. basically, Andrew Lloyd Webber promised her that she'd be able to transfer the role to Broadway and whatever. It was in her contract and all that. And then suddenly. In her contract? Close, yes, in her contract. <laughs> um, and. Then he was like, you know, in L.A., we're going to do a production while you're in London um, and we're just going to have Glenn Close star in it. And Glenn Close got great reviews and Patty got middling reviews. But Glenn Close also sang a much easier vocal range. They brought they tuned down the score for her vocals and Patty is screaming every night. Um, Then, of course, Andrew Lloyd Webber behind her back um, promises the role to Glenn Close and... Then she, of course, transferred to Broadway, and Patty didn't learn about this until it was in the tabloids, and she sued Andrew Lloyd Webber, and it was a big public hubbubaloo. Yikes. I mean, did, did she win? I assume she won. Yes, she did. She now has the Andrew Lloyd Webber memorial pool in her house because she, he is dead to her. <laughs> oh, my God. You know, she's fun and light. That's the thing you love about Patty. She's fun and she's light. Exactly. Never holds a grudge. Which, <laughs> Except this one time, but <laughs> no, she she just don't pull out your phone, guys. Um, um, it's funny. I mean, it's frustrating that uh, Broadway stars are uh, replaced so easily by movie stars. However, in this particular instance, it does kind of make sense to have an aging movie star do it because that's the whole thing. That's the role. I, yeah. Yes, I get that, but also contractual obligations, they're kind of a thing, and the, the fact that Andrew Lloyd Webber is too much of a chicken shit to even tell her, like, all that just screams, like, bad business, which leaves a terrible taste well, in my welcome mouth. Welcome to Musicals with Cheese, where we talk where we talk business and legal advice. Uh. <laughs> and yes. I just prefer this Patty is- vocally <laughs> to um, Glenn Close. But you were lucky enough to see Betty Buckley, who I think both performs the role better than either of the women. Yeah, I think you're probably correct on that. I didn't um, listen to that yeah, one at all, so <laughs> she's amazing. Um, but I believe are they are they still uh, in talks? That they're still going to do the movie, right? Um, after the 2017 Broadway, they said they were going to do the movie with Glenn Close. I mean, I think he's all focused on the wonderful upcoming Cats movie, and I'm sure if that does well, that'll be a shoe in for what's next. Oh my god. The cat. I can't wait um, for Sunset Boulevard being performed by horrible CGI monsters. <laughs> yeah, we're all CGI it. I mean, I love Glenn Close, but there is something funny about the entire plot is that it's a 50-year-old woman who can't accept aging, and that role will be played by a 70-year-old woman. <laughs> it's like a little meta. I mean, Glenn Close can play 50, though. <laughs> Oh, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just it's just a funny wrinkle in it to me. But you know what? I'll go see it. We know I'm going to go see it. So what do they care about my opinion? <laughs> I'd rather see this movie than the Cats movie. I mean, that yeah, that movie looks like a travesty. 
I uh, mean, I think Cats might be the first like blockbuster, ir- ironic blockbuster. Like it's gonna be so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I have to see it, you know, and I feel like exactly. <laughs> would you see it if you didn't do this show, Andrew? I feel like I would. It's going to be so it's kind of like replacing Sonic because like Sonic got all messed up and now they're redoing it. But cats, they're just putting out there. So that's that's going to take its place. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. <laughs> what do you think dr- makes you so connected to this show? Like what draws you to this show? <laughs> You know, I like the story. I do like behind the scenes Hollywood things in general. I also like that there's everyone's motivation. Kind of, no one's an angel and no one's fully a devil in it. Um, everyone's pretty complicated, and you can see where they're coming from moment to moment. Like I think it is purely psycho- uh, psychological. Um, and I. I think that I mean I just love the music too. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Patty, I like I, Andrew's music. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing I discovered with this, and I was chatting to Andrew about this. I discovered in this that Andrew Lloyd Webber really should have had a career in composing musical scores for films because his instrumental scores in this are incredible. Like some of his best work in his entire career. It's when people start singing and the lyrics start coming in that it all suddenly oh this doesn't fit. <laughs> In my opinion, it doesn't at work. Least. Yeah, it doesn't work for you. Mm-mm. He has some songs I find where he'll repeat the same melody line over and over and put different words over it with no regards to how the <laughs> cadence of those words should sound. Uh, I think Let's Have Lunch is like the worst offender in this case. It's just the whole song repeats the same melody line and they and the words don't fit properly, in my opinion, of course. I'm sure other people love it, so... Yeah, you're you're probably right. I think just like, for instance, that scene, like I just love like Hollywood people hanging out like that's enough. I'm in. <laughs> I'm like, cool. no, I, I like that aspect of it. And, and honestly, I don't hate the song. Uh, it's kind of a catchy melody line. It's just sometimes you kind of feel awkward with how the words are being how they're coming out, I guess. Yeah, I do think, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. I do think this one is a weird, and I think if you listen to both cast recordings, it is strange how different it can sound, uh, depending on interpretation. Yeah, I think mostly that was on the um, the recording I was listening to, the 93 one, and it wasn't so much in the uh, show that I was uh, hooked up with by Jess. <laughs> yeah, he saw the Glenn Close revival footage of that. Mm-hmm. Which... I will say, um, I, I feel like Glenn Cro- Close really grew into the role, and I think she's incredible in this most recent revival. I just wish the set was the same from the original production. Yeah, that was weird. The, like, the car and stuff? I, I don't know. It was it was definitely a little What'd strange. What'd they do with the car? Well, I just mean, not... Well, um, I just... It felt uh, lower... Um, I mean, just lower budget, honestly. I mean, that's what my interpretation was. And it was, like, more... Like some cool choices, like I don't know, you know, theater's so weird. Like sometimes you'll see a cool choice at like a certain level of production, and you're like, wow, that's really clever how they made that seem more expensive. But when you're watching Broadway, you're like, why didn't you just get the thing? <laughs> like what? Like <laughs> like when they're in the car race, they just use like flashlights to be headlights. That's what I'm thinking of. Um, oh, okay. And it's like, and it's like okay, what? Yeah, um, why? <laughs> I mean, not that you're gonna have a full car race on a stage, but I don't know something else. Maybe that's what they did in the first one. Just... I just don't remember it. I do remember there being like an actual car on the stage at some point. Well, there there is a car because that's her car that the that Cecil B. DeMille wants to use in his movie. <laughs> now, do you have any experience nice with car. the original film, Caitlin? I've seen it. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I like now. Do it. you have any preference between the musical and the film? I like the musical better, but that's just because, again, I'm just a shameless musical fan. Uh, I think that the film is generally still better regarded, you know, but eh, what can you do? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that the script for the musical takes what was in the film and makes it better in a way that a lot of musicals, I find musical adaptations of film does. Um, And it brings it up to a higher level of melodrama that just suits the story that they're doing a lot better than the grounded walls of a film. So honestly, I think this is an improvement, so to say, on the Billy Wilder film. And I know that's sacrilege to say. I'm hey, I'm with you. I like the way you said it. But yeah, I think the, <laughs> the, uh, 
the cool kid opinion would be against us, but we're not interested in that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, now, Andrew, I've never seen the film, are. but I think it's better. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, what are your actual thoughts on this? Because this is your first experience with this show altogether. Uh, I actually quite liked it. Uh, a lot of the music... Uh, anyone who's listened to this show for a long time knows that I like jazzy music, and a lot of the music is pretty jazzy. <laughs> Um, and I love old Hollywood type stuff, and the story is probably the strongest part for the whole thing. Um, I know it's actually a movie, I've never seen the movie, so, yeah. It reminded me of two other properties, which are, is, uh, oh my goodness, uh, The Disaster Artist, which actually references the movie, and it's a similar story, and Bernie as well, which are two things that I'd really enjoy. So, it, I was, I was enjoying it. You described it as <laughs> Bernie if the ending was reversed? Yes! <laughs> Bernie, but instead of the captive person killing their captor the other way around. Spoilers. Oops. <laughs> I want to talk about how this is this should be regarded as a feminist piece, so to say. Especially the musical, at least. Only because, like, no man in this show has any resolve at all. The only people with resolve and drives and wills to do anything are the women, and I kind of, I was here for it, so to say. What about, true. what about poor, poor old Max? Max is a... He's got some... Max is the, he does nothing! He's he's obedient to his ex-wife. Yeah, I mean, when we meet um, Max, he's burying a monkey. I mean, right. Max's life is weird. Yeah, but he knows what he's doing. He, he is... Uh, Nor- he's Norma's keeper. He's not obedient has- to her. He's just keeping her sane. Wow. <laughs> his balls Max, are in a Max box a in her room. room, and we all know it. Max is the real hero of the story. He's the hero she deserves. That could be true. Um, yeah, you're right. And um, Betty is a great character, too. And I, I don't know how common female screenwriters were back then. I'm going to say not very. Uh, but there's a few that are you know, also in the chorus and stuff. And it's just not even like... It's not specifically made an issue in a way that I like. Um, it's just sort of accepted that she's a writer and she's like pushing on this story. I I love that every female character has a thing to do, a reason why they like it, and yeah, they like their men, but they also have their own goals. Like, Norma Desmond's relationship with her dream of being a star has nothing to do with her relationship with Joe Gillis. Well, and she's using him to become a star again, or trying to use him to become a star again. Well, yeah, but it her love for him doesn't have to do with, like... You can make me like she's not using her body to try to seduce him to make her a star. Yeah, yeah. But I do think that she's in love with him because he is the idea of her being a star again. And that's why she loves him, I think. But I might be reading too much into that. But I'm going to read into (laughs) something else really quick, too. Um, I want to talk about how Betty and Norma are basically yin and yang to one another. So Betty is someone that was going to be an actress. Her parents forced her to be an actress. She got a nose job to be an actress. And then she was told she can't act. And then she's like, all right, I'll move on with my life and find some other thing that brings me joy. And Norma Desmond is basically that same person. She tries to act. She did it for a bit. And then she's gone. And now she's gone crazy because she can't she can't find anything that will bring her that joy. She has no self-satisfaction to that. Totally, because um, for Norma, it's it's so much about fame. And for Betty, it seems to actually be about doing the work. Like she finds something that she becomes passionate about and writing, but then specifically the, the story, uh, Blind Windows. Um, and it's, it's not as much about external validation. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, anything else you guys want to say about the story before we move to a mid-show announcement? Yes. Hang on. <laughs> I, there was something I wanted to say about it. I can't, I can't quite remember what it was. How about that ending? Yeah, can we talk about the ending if we're going to talk about the story and just be done with it? Because the ending's yeah. awesome. The ending is one of the best <laughs> endings in musical theater, and I discovered this way too late. Like, I, I did not go into this expecting to like this as much as I did because I have a slight vendetta against a lot of Andrew Lloyd Webber's musicals, but I think this is probably up right up there with his best work, and that ending is as audacious as, like, the crucifixion from, like, Jesus Christ Superstar. Totally. It's really good. 
Um, and it's fun live too, because everyone anticipates the line, but it's still somehow bigger than the moment you are anticipating. Like when she says, no, but I'm ready for my close up. It's like, everyone knows that's what's going to happen, <laughs> but it's, it still surpasses that, which is hard. It's really hard when there's like an expected line in a show. That's always a kind of a weird feeling. Um, they have to do it perfectly because everyone's expecting it to be perfect. So it's like Hamlet. Yes. You can't perform Hamlet anymore, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you got to be damn good if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> but who is the hero of this story? I'm curious. Like, who do you guys consider the mainline hero? Because we don't even meet Norma until 30 minutes into Act One. And really, um, Joe Gillis is kind of a shitbag. I mean, who do you think is the protagonist or who do you think is the hero? The protagonist oh. is um, Norma Desmond because she has the I Want song. Oh, interesting. I do think of the protagonist as being Joe Gillis, but I mean, mainly just because he's sort of... It's interesting, though, because he's also sort of the narrator. It's... There's a lot of things Well, going Joe on. doesn't really want anything is the thing. And honestly, his... He kind of just gives up halfway fuck halfway through. <laughs> he's like, yeah, he's I mean, like you know what? I'm fine just living with this lady. I'm <laughs> whatever. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, that's what the, the titular song Sunset Boulevard is basically like. Well, folks, eh, I sure tried. I but... give up. <laughs> I tried, but you know what? I, this is good enough. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. You're right. Interesting. I got another question about Joe Gillis, because I find the ending scene where he just berates Betty and kicks her out. I want to know your guys' opinion on that. I mean, I'm sure we all think like he did it for Betty's sake or did he do it for Norma's sake? I always assumed he did it for Betty's sake, but it's not it's not great. <laughs> he didn't do it for Norma's sake because he leaves right afterwards. So why would he do that? Why do you do it at all if he's going to leave right afterwards? It's kind of the thing. Yeah. Why not I leave with think, her? Yeah, I guess I think he knows he's a disaster and it's not going to go anywhere. And Artie is like a good guy. Um, well, he he probably sees that she actually cares about stuff and he's totally given up on his life. So he doesn't want to drag her down. I guess I could see I, that. I've heard yeah. theories that he knew that Norma was going to try to kill him and want her to like get away. I feel like if he knew that, he would be asking for help or something, not sending her away. <laughs> and I've seen productions where he, like, whispers something in her ear before she walks out, too. Huh. That's just bizarre, though. Like, is he suicidal? Like, is that what they're implying? Like, he wants to be dead? <laughs> It's a strange scene. It really it ruins the flow, and it's kind of weird in the original movie, too. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. the only good way to interpret it is that he, he kicks her out for her sake, and he doesn't know that anything else is going to happen. Yeah, what does he think he's going to do at that point? I have actually never <laughs> thought about that. What, what, like, what does he imagine the next day is like, regardless? What's the end <laughs> game for this? <laughs> Yeah, so he's dumped Is Betty, he still paying rent on his out. apartment? Well, he's not Probably paying for the not. car. <laughs> uh, you know what? He's not paying for this. anything. The lady's paying. Yeah, the lady pays. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is not going to fit anywhere in the podcast, and I'm glad we're about to go into a mid-show, but one of my favorite things about that 1993 recording is Patty Lapone during The Lady's Paying, where she just kind of gives up on saying words, and she's like, ah la la ba da 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 I love that. It's weird she was Just fired. Just stick that in there somewhere. <laughs> I mean, the lyric was she cringy. She was fired. Anyway. She it's was like, replaced. I like, I like flannel on a man. So she says, I like flannel. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, you Just get keep it. that in. That's perfect. You get it. <laughs> Isn't this a studio recording? Couldn't they have just done it again? <laughs> Patty Lapone doesn't have the best diction in the world to start I, out with. I about the last thing I do ever as like a sound engineer in a booth would be tell Patty to do it again. Uh, yeah. Just like, yeah, that works. Thumbs up. Nailed it again. No, no, if you're a set I I've met several sound engineers. They have no problem being an asshole. <laughs> That's like their main thing. <laughs> if you're an asshole to Patty Lapone, you might not live through the night. You might get shot three times trying to leave. Ah. All right, let's go into a mid-show announcement. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi guys, sorry to interrupt you in the middle of the show, but I'm here to shill at you and let you know that today's show is brought to you by the extremely <laughs> kind donations by our donors over at Patreon. Our current Patreon donors are Stephanie L., Terry Needleman, Max Lunig, Benjamin Lair, Chris O'Kelly, Lily Ackles, Mackenzie Horner, John Donna, Taryn the Duck, Actual Duck, Melissa Gl- Goldman, not an actual Goldman, Jess Lightning, the best Jess, <laughs> Ewan Cassidy, Haley McDonald, Taskier, Cal McLeod, Fire Up September, Sam Bergman, Mina M- Moniri, and Monica Thoreau. <laughs> I think it was a little extra, too, extra financial support that helps pronounced. us keep keep the lights on here at Musicals with Cheese. If you'd like to join them in supporting us and get tons of fun perks, such as patron-only commentaries, our episode is a day early, or even earlier, come join us over at Patreon. All right, let's get back to the show. It hanging. I got a date with Sheldrake. Shooting our western down at Fox. How can you work with Dare? We should talk. Gotta run. Ooh, let's have lunch. Hi, Mr. Gillis. You look great. I'm up for an audition. Sheldrake is driving me insane. Don't forget me when you're casting. We should talk. Gotta run. Let's have lunch. Morning, Joanna. Sheldrake, but do I need I've it? I spent the last month I'm fasting in my second I'm shooting a western down at Fox. I'd really love to Don't read it. Don't forget me when you're casting. We should talk. We should call a run. run. Let's have lunch. So we touched on Let's Have Lunch before, but what do you guys think of that song altogether? It's a weird opening number. I'm kind of okay with it as an opener because it introduces the setting decently well since it's like Hollywood, you get the hustle and bustle of everything and, you know, it is a little bit muddled though just because there's so many characters that are in it, but... That's true, you know, I, 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 um... It's hard to put myself in the shoes of someone who doesn't know it so well. So, like, it's obviously very easy for me to digest. It might be one that really helps to see and not just listen to the... um, uh, I could definitely see that, because when you're looking at it, you can see the characters, like, come and go. Um, Yes. But when you you are listening to it, it's just kind of a bunch of voices. (laughs) Yeah. I love some good, you know, chorus work in the background. People just miming, having conversations. Uh, so, you know, I love it. You just see them move in and out. They're saying peas and carrots to themselves or whatever. And um, it's definitely, it is kind of funny just because I guess it just sets up the the world they live in, but it doesn't ultimately have that much to do with the rest of the show. <laughs> I guess, in the sense that he's struggling to work and like that's it's the networking. I mean, I think I prefer it over just like some generic song about Hollywood, which they could have done. (laughs) Yeah, you're exactly right. We don't have enough of those. Yeah, a very specific experience they have versus like Hollywood. (laughs) You know, hooray Uh, for Hollywood. (laughs) (laughs) Did you just write that? That's great. Um, yeah, I just wrote that. Oh, awesome. Beautiful. That's great, dude. That's awesome. Um, yeah. But I went to the Paramount Studios. Just don't, just studios. don't watch the Oscars. <laughs> I went to the Paramount Studios last month, actually, and I was like, Ooh. actually, yeah, this is kind of like what that is. I mean, it's a fairly accurate description of what's going on moment to moment, even now. Incredible. Um, for the... Honestly, for the longest time, I've heard the song Sunset Boulevard and I always assumed like there was like a major key opening number called like Sunset Boulevard where the entire wow. ensemble singing it. And then I'm like, oh, that's not how we open this. Wow, that's weird. Well, yeah, it is a title song. It's like it, it's interesting. <laughs> that's interesting that it doesn't open it, but it, it opens. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. No, it, open it opens two? act two. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. You're right. But it's but, but most of the characters never go to Sunset Boulevard. Like most of the characters yeah. never go to what he's talking about. Right. Right, right. That makes sense too. I don't know. I, I it always I, the let's have lunch feels more like it belongs in a show like City of Angels or something a little bit more noirish. It doesn't feel quite like Hollywoody enough. It feels more like we're about to see Eddie Valiant looking for Roger Rabbit. Right, uh, right. But that's that's I mean, that's a Hollywood type thing. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, the entire name of the show is weird because Sunset Boulevard is a very long. <laughs> road in los angeles <laughs> that goes through many different types of neighborhoods and actually is evocative of not much 
<laughs> but here it's used to mean like like sort of the where the stars live which does not really relate to today but well um, it, i mean it's it's a interesting title because sunset boulevard you know where that is and also just the term sunset and you sure, have this yes. uh the star that is fading uh right, essentially right. so right yeah i think that's exactly. a brilliant title and i think that's a great imagery for norma desmond <laughs> So um, it makes sense, but yes, as far as location, if the location, like, setting up song was called Sunset Boulevard, that would mean very little. Yeah, it wouldn't <laughs> really make sense. <laughs> right, oh, right, right. Was to fight, white flags fly tonight, you are out of danger now. Can we talk about another thing that I think was baffling when I first saw it, which is surrender? Oh yeah. Really? Yeah. What's what um, do you think is so weird about it? It's basically I mean, yeah, I guess it is basically the song where she obviously equates stopping working in the industry as dying. <laughs> um and it's a real slow downer of a song. Is that the first song she sings? Yes. That's her intro song. Yeah, and it's a real downer. And it's also like, if I can't do this, I will die. <laughs> um, but please tell us who she's singing it to. Oh, well, she's singing it to the monkey, right? Mm -hmm. Is that right? <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> I think I forgot so about this. Oh, my goodness. She's promising her monkey, who's died, by the way, for the dear listeners that don't know, um, <laughs> that... Uh, that she will never surrender. I mean, it's it's really like promising someone, like, I'm going to do it for you. Uh, yeah, it's weird. I think I blocked out. She's going to avenge her monkey by becoming a, a, a star again. Right. Very Michael exactly. Jackson of her. <laughs> yes. I'm so sorry, Teeny. I'm going to become a star. <laughs> It's just a weird <laughs> intro song. Like, this is where you'd... Like, With One Look is such a good intro number. And I, I, I don't know about you, but I think I might just cut, like, Surrender out and maybe put it a little yeah. later in the show. I like when Surrenders comes back and the director guy sings it. Oh, yeah, I love that. Right, right, right. Um, Yeah, With One Look is so, so good and so specific, too. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, we all grieve monkeys in different ways. And this was normal. <laughs> I, I was so sad when my monkey died. Oh no. Let's talk about with one look. 
Right. With one look, I like a lot because it's very specifically about the the experience that she was a silent movie star. So it's not just that she's aging as an actress. It's that she wasn't a big star in talkies and no one's making silent films anymore. Uh, and it is like she says, like, with one look, I can break your heart. With one look, I play every part. And it's it's beautiful. And you like believe her in that moment. But then at the same time, you're like, well, that's nuts. <laughs> That probably wasn't true. Um, so I really like the song in that, like, you're on her side, but also get a sense that she's gone mad. <laughs> and it's uh, You didn't the- get that from Surrender, though? <laughs> I guess so. I mean, I guess you get it from literally her entrance, but uh, <laughs> even more so. Um, I have had some issues with this song, despite me loving it so much. And it's the lyrics. I'm not a big fan of, like, unnecessary words for the sake of a rhyme. Like, specifically, I'm thinking, like, um, no words can tell the stories my eyes tell. You watch me when I frown. You can write that down. You can write that down isn't a lyric that precedes anything. It doesn't fit anything. Why is that there? That's a qualifier just to fit a rhyme. Jess, you are such a nitpicky asshole. And, and you know I'm right. It's there right in now. black and white. You know I'm right. It's only there for, like, for, like, to, for that rhyme. And it's not even that good a rhyme. <laughs> Jess, what do you want about? Okay, what do you want? <laughs> it, I just want like purposeful lyrics, so to say. Like each line kind of means something instead of just being like, you know what I mean, and just saying this, rephrasing it again, like qualifying my last statement with another statement. You know what I mean? Yeah, that kind of thing. Well, That's it's because lyrics my you dream. can't. You can't write that down. Forgive me. Yes. Yeah, because she's just, I mean, that's actually a part that's not like fully, she also doesn't respect writing. (laughs) Right. (laughs) She doesn't think it's like good or important, which is a funny part of her obsession with Joe and them writing this script together. Um, Mm -hmm. Well, she was from silent films, which uh, are not really known for their plots. Totally. (laughs) It all all makes total sense, but... Mm-hmm. You know, guys. It d- I think she's it does have the geeky. best. <laughs> it has the best laugh in the entire show, in my opinion. And I think it's really bold to have like a great laugh after a big ballad, which is when she just suddenly realizes he's there, and she's like, "Now go." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah, he was just an <laughs> audience for her. <laughs> what do you think of this song, Andrew? Uh, I don't think I have anything to add beyond what you guys have already said. To be honest. Wow, I'm so good. glad I do a podcast with you. Let's go on to the next song. <laughs> you have a guest on here, you're both saying stuff. What do you want? I need you without you, Joe. I need you. I've sent out every single invitation. All right, Norma, I give in. Of course you do. And when they dress you, you'll cause a sensation. We equip the chosen few of Movie Land. Certain parts are worth the lady paying And why not have it all? The lady's paying <laughs> Right, so Andrew, I'm gonna let you go first and s- So you have shit to say then oh, Okay, well this is, uh, this is when Joe starts getting totally spoiled It's the best <laughs> Um <laughs> Um, I'm sorry, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, that most of the song is just Norma singing, or am I wrong? No, it's the, like, dressers coming uh, in being like... Yeah, like the tailor. Oh, you're right, you're right. No, no, you're right, you're right. And then everybody comes in and they're all singing. No, this is <laughs> yeah. a great one, I like this one. I think I was thinking of... I don't remember which one I was thinking of. Right, and you know, to your earlier point about the show's feminism, this is a rare, yes. like man gets a makeover and it's sort of like a well, the, reverse pretty woman he found a uh, he finds his uh, his sugar mama so is that what they story. call him there's another word for it yeah you nailed it <laughs> mm-hmm. 
This I think this is, is one. Is a fun, it's a funny song. Yeah, yeah, and the lyrics are great here. It's so perfectly goofy where it's like, I can show you what you can do with your Vicuna. Like, that's fucking great. It's a fun chaos, too, of who's being spoken to because they're like mm-hmm. measuring him and like talking to each other about Taylor stuff and uh, also talking to him and also talking to her. It's very cool. Mm-hmm. And musically, it's like up there with the comedy songs like Prima Donna from Phantom. Like, it feels like equally as fun chaos. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a high point of the show right before you get into all the sour stuff from the next act. Yeah. 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 Let's just skip to Sunset Boulevard then. <laughs> Sunset Boulevard, which is a really good Act 2 opener, despite it giving a a good recap of Act 1 and his placement emotionally in Act 2. Right. Without giving any plot. I yeah. actually really like this song. I do too. Um, and and I, lo- I love the uh, staging where he's just kind of chilling, you know? <laughs> 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 yeah, well, he's just made his decision. I mean, the end of Act One is, um, well, not the very, very end, but it's uh, by this time next year, you know, the fun, uh, happy New Year's 1950, we're all going to make it. And he kind of is ambivalent about whether he's going to leave this whole ins- insane situation. In fact, he's kind of resolved to do it. And then he doesn't. And then when we meet him again in Sunset Boulevard, he's like, oh, yeah, I, I didn't leave. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I'm still very much here. I didn't leave. This is, this is what I do now. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm into it. I bang old ladies. It's fun. Pretty catchy little tune, too, with the, the Sunset Boulevard part. I like it. Right. It's quite good. Mm-hmm. And it's intense. It feels a lot more intense than what the content is, if that makes sense, in a good way. Well, it's more. It's even more intense when they come back to it later on. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think then we have to talk about the song. The big song. Whispered conversation. In overcrowded hallways So much to say Not just today But always We'll have any floating madness We'll have magic big song to me uh, oh yeah amazing hog guy <laughs> <laughs> this song this is... one's uh norma's big number right yes right. i would stand it... for 10 minutes after this song if i ever heard it live it is crazy yeah mm-hmm. um it's when she's back on the lot and she recognizes a crew member who makes her feel special and he literally puts the spotlight on her uh his name is hog guy i don't know the backstory <laughs> of that would love to know uh, <laughs> that deserves its own it's just musical. his last name gosh <laughs> hog eye pig lip i don't know um and it's it's actually touching too because she never really talks about anyone else before like the fact that she had a like friendship even a casual work one with anyone is like fairly surprising <laughs> um <laughs> And uh, she just loves being on the lot. That's actually where you see her almost connect more back to who Betty is. Like, she actually just, like, likes being there. Hmm. That, that is a good comparison. I love that. I, like, yeah, she does become that 17-year-old girl that Max describes much later. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, is, like... Do you, oh, think she's, do you think she's singing 
directly to the crew members or i i thought it was more of a metaphorical like for the whole uh scenario like she never left the yeah, stage you know or the no i think you're right i think it's just um it's that environment though like it's actually just shooting the movies and like you know being a part of the movies um oh yeah yeah but i think mm-hmm. i mean hog eye is what seems to directly trigger it so i do think it's somewhat the people there mm-hmm Well, she specifically references the people, the overcrowded hallways, the whispered conversations, like she's describing the people more than like, I'm the center of attention, which I find that's some good lyric writing there. That's like a good, like consistent idea. It's always making her not seem so much of uh, just in it for I want to be famous and that's it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Which we've never actually enjoyed doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I also say this is a seven minute song that doesn't feel like seven minutes. I had no idea it was that long. Wow. Yeah, and I complain about how long Music of the Night is, because that's like a five-minute song, and I don't like it because of that. Whereas this song is like, all right, if you got a great actress on stage, she can win this, and it has the right ebbs and flows, where by the end you're like, yes, it will be bigger. <laughs> you're on her side. <laughs> yeah. Totally. And it's it's like her reckoning also with the fact that she's isolated herself and she says you know that's all in the past like um Mm -hmm. taking some small small uh (laughs) accountability for um you know things not going great (laughs) can i give a little confession of how dumb i was when i first heard this song please yes do it so i like many people used to listen to like the broadway like andrew lloyd weber hits cd and i would just turn that on and listen to it and i just heard like i'm coming out of makeup and i'm like what does that mean are you like tearing off your makeup what (laughs) right in context context, it makes a lot more (laughs) sense she was washing her face that's what you thought it meant For context, Jess went to school for uh, film. So <laughs> let's not pretend I was like nineteen when I heard. It. I was like eight. <laughs> it's funnier to picture you as nineteen. Nineteen years old. What do you mean coming out of makeup? No, I'm explaining. What does that mean? <laughs> no, this song is incredible, and I might reckon it might be Andrew Lloyd Webber's best song. Or at least his best female written song. Yeah. Yeah. I can't think of a better one. Like, even Argentina, like, eh. Yeah. I, I think I agree with you. And then now we're into Act 2, which is just a bunch of reprises, and then the show ends. Like every <laughs> Angel Lloyd Webber musical. That's true. There is a lot of reprises in the yeah, second is. act. It's aggressive. Mm-hmm. Um, but hey, give the people what they liked before. <laughs> In a way, like, yes, thematic, ties, and all that, but also, like, come on, throw us a new song in Act 2. Yeah, well, let's see. We're... I mean, Sunset Boulevard and, and those earlier ones were in Act 2, technically. Yeah, you got two new songs in Act 2 and everything else is a reprise. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> let's see. <laughs> I, I remember Roger Ebert once said that Andrew Lloyd Webber writes five songs and then repeats it 95 times and calls it a musical. and i don't think he's entirely wrong but sometimes it's really effective and i think this is one of those times it's pretty effective yeah well yeah Um, and i think when it come when they come back it makes sense like most the uh most of the reprises in this actually do make sense mm -hmm. it's not like they just reprise it for the sake of it Mm -hmm. right and there's something thematically about you know she's sort of losing it and she's so focused on memory and you know, frankly, repeating things that it's sort of sort of thematically he gets away with it with this one. I agree. Um, but let's talk about the new ways to dream reprise because we didn't talk about it. So let's just talk about that song altogether, because Max basically gives the entire backstory between him and um, Norma. Yes, I like Max. Max is like the best character in this. I think. <laughs> you think? I don't know. Norma is so interesting. Yeah, you're a Max. Norma's guy. interesting, but Max Max is just so nice. I don't know. <laughs> I feel bad for him. <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> for sure. No easy days for Max. I mean, how do you end up in that position? How do you let yourself end up in that position? I mean, he tries to explain in the song. I just can't wrap my mind around it. 
how you become I your ex-wife. The, the part partner. that I don't get, yeah, is the fact that he is the ex-husband is weird. Um, oh, well, yeah. If he was just like the, a director that really cared about her, that would make a little more sense. But like, why would you stay with your ex? That's just awkward. <laughs> you know, and we don't know. We never learned that 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 much about Max. And I feel like I wonder, you know, he obviously just compulsively needs to take care of her. And I don't know if that's because that's his character or did something happen where he feels, you know, he's responsible for her rise. So he needs to sort of help her with the fall. I don't know. It's truly one of the weirdest turns. Like, if you don't know that's coming. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm not just their butler. I'm a, a great film director and her ex-husband. Just so you know. When did he stop calling her Norma and start calling her like the the mistress Miss or the madam? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. And when did he start writing the thank you letters? And when did Norma be like, these all look like the same handwriting? <laughs> no, he is a typewriter. <laughs> My dad has the same handwriting as Santa Claus. That's weird. <laughs> um i i think he is just a really nice guy and <laughs> he's into it he's into it that's for sure but he's also like someday i want to be max he's also supporting some really dangerous behavior like every time there's a suicide attempt he's like well i need to make her feel good don't i like no he's taking yeah. her to a hospital <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Or like the time where she shot somebody and he was just like, the cameras are here. You're <laughs> famous been... again, darling. The time <laughs> that happened. Uh, you know when that happens. <laughs> or like when she starts supporting some weird man that just drove into her house at a random occasion. <laughs> <laughs> I know I help my wife when she brings some young fella around. <laughs> she wants yeah. to bang him? Go with me. <laughs> <laughs> poor max poor max um who has it worse max or joe well max uh through the show max but at the end uh i don't know i feel like i don't know what max's fate is but i feel like death might be better it could be cause it, it could be because he's gonna right, have what to do we think where, where does he go yeah what is the yeah. postscript where does he after, go like, after the, the show? curtain goes up what happens to everyone <laughs> I mean, it's well, Joe's to, dead. Joe's dead, so he he's pretty set. Uh, you know, I don't. Norma know goes Max, to prison. For Max sure. applies to a new butler job, and that's very difficult with the reference situation being. Max becomes Norma's lawyer in a extremely long uh, death penalty case. <laughs> it's uh, L.A. They don't have the death penalty in the fifties. <laughs> um, I hope I hope Betty gets blind windows made. Uh, yes, please. It's a big she hit. does. She yeah. definitely does. But she writes under like a like a ghostwriter, so she's like B B whatever her last name is. No, 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 no. She she just publishes it as a uh, as just Joe did it, and then that becomes super successful because he's dead. Oh, you're oh. going Dear Evan Hansen style. I gotcha. And then she keeps, <laughs> she keeps uh, quote unquote finding new screenplays he wrote and making them. Oh my goodness, where did I find this? Finally, he gets to make that baseball picture he's been dying to make. <laughs> <laughs> but what happens to norma do you think she like gets out or do you think she like no she's in prison forever i don't no, think so i think be, she it could be fun for her for a while to get all the media coverage yeah i think she plays it like oj she might go she might go to an asylum i don't uh, i think she gets like an insanity plea goes to therapy for a while then goes out still has all her money and then suddenly she's doing a bunch of talk shows you know like martha stewart it really depends if uh, if Linkladder makes a movie about her or not. Uh, and this time we'll be bigger and brighter than we knew it. So watch me fly, we all know I can do it. Could I stop my hand from shaking? Has there ever been a moment with so much to live? <laughs> on that note, what is your guys' overall thoughts on Sunset Boulevard and your cheese rating? It's it's really good. <laughs> I mean, it is certainly uh, one of my favorite Andrew Lloyd Webber that we've seen. How does it um, rank around with them? With the like... rankings. 
Like, would you put Jesus yeah. Christ Superstar over it? I think I might actually put this over Jesus Christ Superstar. I actually think I like some of the music better, and I like the story better overall. Um, obviously, uh, Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat is at the very top. <laughs> um, it is the greatest. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but this is right below it, of course. Uh, <laughs> no, I really, really enjoyed this. Uh, definitely, if you have not seen it or listened to it, seek it out. There's a lot of great music in it, and the story is epic. <laughs> of course, the story's taken from a movie, so I guess I can't give the musical full credit for that, but uh, it's great. It is excellent. As far as a cheese rating goes, uh, cheese. What is a very Hollywood cheese? Um, honestly, I don't think there is a good Hollywood cheese. Jess, I, I, I want to come back to mine. Can, okay. Can you go first here? Um, I'm going to let Caitlin go now. Um, cool. Well, you know, I'm a fan because I made you guys talk <laughs> about it for an hour. Um, uh, love it. I definitely think, uh, as Andrew said, seek it out if you can, because it's, it's sort of a hidden gem, I think. I mean, it's because there hasn't been a movie musical version yet i think that's the thing uh but but search it out uh if you're hopefully there will be a movie version they're saying there was going to be but i don't know what happened with that um and maybe that will finally get glenn coast her oscar and it'll be truly the meta moment we all need Um, are you saying that this time it will be bigger and brighter than we knew it i am actually saying that that is a direct quote from me um and <laughs> I love it. Uh, cheese rating. So what? What should I? Should I just give okay. it any type of cheese? A cheese that you think feels give it, uh, like it relates to the musical. Any? I'm gonna give it bacon and cheese fries because I just kind of been feeling that right now. Oh wow! Uh, so <laughs> it's not a cheese, but whatever. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna give it um, a brie cheese. I feel like that's what Max served Ooh. to Joe and. <laughs> <laughs> Norma. Oh yeah, that year. would make a lot of sense. Happy New Year's. I think that yes. definitely Max would be serving Brie. Well, my opinions are surprisingly positive on this because I've talked so much mess about Andrew Lloyd Webber, and I still stand by every one of his crit- criticisms I have for him. I think he's a mean, mean businessman, and I think the way that he handled this show and its creation and its inception was really shady, but that shouldn't dismiss the other work of the actors, the performers, um, the incredible, incredible, like, book that was written. Um, honestly, I think the show is one of Andrew Lloyd Webber's best, and it might be his last great musical we get from him, because, I don't know, unless everyone's really, really a big fan of The Woman in right, White, I think this is his last great one. Mm-hmm. Uh, School of Rock, excuse me? <laughs> I, 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 I still stand by my statement. So, overall, okay. my cheese... Cheese What's rating cheese? is Vromage, <laughs> the first dairy-free cheese shop. Um, they make specifically Vromage cheese, and it's located on 7988 West Sunset Boulevard, Los Angeles, California. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Jess always goes way too in-depth with the cheese wow. rating. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what else? Um... Caitlin. What else? I'm sure you've got a lot of stuff you want to promote. Promote it out for the world so everyone can find your incredible work. All right. Well, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Caterade, C-A-I-T-O-R-A-D-E. And I do a lot of live performing at UCB Hell's Kitchen in New York. Specifically, I have a one-woman show called Shrewd, a one true show. And I'm the director of Toxic Masculinity, the musical. Please come out, musical fans. Mm Mm-hmm. All right. Um, that's incredible. Are you on Twitter or anything like that? At Caterade. Okay, same thing. All right. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? And forgive me yeah. if this is too much. Um, it says when I Google you, your name is Caitlin Tagart. Oh, that's my maiden name. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. All well, right. That's funny that that came up. So, all right. Um, all right. Cool. Just so no confusing. <laughs> They're the same person. It's the one and the same. Mm-hmm. Um, she has an incredible website it has all of her stuff you'll find all the links to every one of these wonderful things that she's done in the description below and now it's time for me to show a bit so um, thank you guys for listening please review us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher at Musicals with Cheese our Twitter is at Cheesy Musicals support us on Patreon at Musicals with Cheese our Instagram is also at Musicals with Cheese same as our YouTube page our email though is musicaltheaterlives at gmail.com our title card was created by the incredible Jolene Casco 
All right. Do you guys have anything else left to say before we wrap this on up? I don't think so. I have one. I have one more thing to say. Okay. I just want to say that my uh, Weberverse theory, where all of Andrew Lloyd Webber's shows are in one universe, <laughs> this does not disrupt that theory whatsoever. I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah. Huh. He, there's no cats there's in There's no cats in this show. <laughs> as long as there's no cats in the show, it doesn't disrupt the theory. All right. I love it. Unless, of course, the cats look like miniature people, in which case, then it supports the theory. <laughs> He's not wow. wrong. What about you, no. Caitlin? Anything left you got to say? I mean, I'm just I'm just going through my head all the shows. I'm making it work, and yeah, yeah, wow. He's not wrong. Is there any... There's no contradictions as far as I can find. No, not all Have you guys seen head. the video? Um, so far. From, like, 2017, when he had, like, five of his shows playing on Broadway. It was Cats, Sunset Boulevard, um, School of Rock, School of Phantom, Rock. and I think one more. And they all did a song together, and it's, like, the most trippiest thing ever. And that is when I realized the Weberverse existed. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, that that was the initial spark for me. I was like, that this is a thing. <laughs> you know what? If you so somewhere out there on Sunset Boulevard, there are little cat people just wandering <laughs> around. <laughs> you know that might be Andrew Lloyd Webber's comeback. His as if we never say goodbye would be his <laughs> Webber verse musical, where like Norma Desmond meets like Jesus meets Joseph meets the cats. Wow, like a red player the one. Cats. Oh man, I'm in. Norma I'm fully Desmond on board for meets this. Rum Tum Tugger and she finds a replacement for Joe Gillis. Oh wow. The ultimate musical fighting game. It's a Weberverse versus a Sondheim. <sighs> All right, guys, we'll see you okay. next time on Musicals with Cheese. <laughs>